talk about an artist I don't expect you to know his name. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Vicar, W-R-C-A-R. -R. You'll see it coming up here in a moment. And um, he is not a household name. I'd like to think he might become a household name in Worcester someday because we have one of his okay. great works. One of the great joys I've had at being at the Worcester Art Museum so long was that early on, when I was uh, actually associate curator, I became curator of European art. Uh, the reason I came to the Worcester Art Museum was because of its great Dutch collection and Flemish collection, which is my specialty. But then I got to oversee, the, and I want to say, the great European collection at the Worcester Art Museum. It was really great when I arrived there. Hopefully I helped add a little bit, including Vicar. But um, Worcester, as I think I told you many times, bought the best, buy one instead of three, but get the best. And if you can't get the best, don't get a bad Raphael or a third-rate one. Mm. And so, um, Another thing about our museum is, and I know this even more now that I'm teaching in college, it's an incredible teaching collection. I knew that, of course, but then when you go and you teach survey of the history of art, you teach in areas that you've not specialized in, like Asian art or pre-Columbian or others, and you really learn how the museum consciously tried to build up a collection of 50 centuries of art from Egyptian to contemporary, both Western and Eastern art. Well, one of my challenges was that we did not have a great neoclassical painting. Now, that might not bother you as much as it bothered me. <laughs> and so today, in a way, it's a little bit of a lesson for you what it's like to be a curator at a great museum. Um, and um, I really wanted to fill that gap. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about neoclassicism. I'm going to tell you about the man who filled the gap. You won't know his name, but you'll, um, this is the painting that we finally acquired. Uh, and it's about as big as you see it on the screen, maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, and it is Electra receiving the ashes of her brother, Orestes. And you can see the dates there. It's actually from the early 19th century, 1826 to 27. I'm going to talk about how I acquired, we acquired this for the museum. We acquired it finally in 1991. But I have to tell you, I was searching for about 15 years to get a neoclassical <coughs> painting. And thanks to the Stoddard Acquisition Fund, we were able to buy it. And it wasn't overpriced or anything like that. It was just to find work because the French have most of those works in the Louvre. You've probably seen them. We'll show you a few. The ones that are in America came very early on. By the time I became curator at the Art Museum, very difficult to get things. You couldn't take anything out of France, even if it were in a private collection, the French would have the right to keep it in their country. So it was going to be something that probably came from England or another country. And so we'll go on from there. Uh, Vicar, uh, his teacher was Jean-Baptiste, or excuse me, Jacques-Louis David. And you probably have heard of him. How many have heard of David? How many, how many have taken the survey of art history or any art history? Yeah. Well, he's the great neoclassical artist, uh, amazing artist who had a number of pupils, but the great artist during the French Revolution. Obviously a very key time in um, French history. And he sets the new movement that parallels the new Fusay democracy, the overthrow of the Ancien Regime. So this is the kind of work that he did. This is one of his most famous works, the Oath of the Arati. And um, what it is, and I could be here all day talking about it, and some of you probably had a lecture on it in college, uh, it's basically taking a subject from ancient history, uh, this is the Othiorati. Uh, these are three men pledging their allegiance to their father with their swords. It's a lesson on patriotism and masculine sacrifice. Uh, and um, basically, these men represent the city of Rome, and they're going to fight against three men of another city, and they're going to have to kill them to be victorious. Now, the problem here is, and there's always a great tragedy looming, uh, is you see the women who are so beautifully depicted, seated, um, and they're weeping. It's a mother, two daughters, and one of the sisters is engaged to a man from the other town. So there's no win here. Even if her brothers win, the other, her husband-to-be is going to be killed. Okay? If her husband-to-be, her fiancé is, is victorious, her brothers will lose their life. So it, it's a sad situation. But we know that life is filled with challenges like this. So they're making parallels um, 
to modern society. In fact, many people consider paintings like this the beginnings of modern art. Taking subject matter, making it very clear, as you can see it tells the story very clearly, um, and uh, relating it to contemporary society. It's a political statement. I'll show you another uh, David in a moment. But um, we'll move on. This is what we call neoclassicism. <clears throat> I think you probably know that from literature, from other areas of arts. And um, it's the great age of enlightenment. <coughs> uh, the 18th century, this comes about at the end of the 18th century in a big way. And it parallels the French Revolution. The, um, I should just go back to say one thing about this painting. This was sponsored by the government, which is really interesting, but it sows the seeds for the French Revolution, as do other paintings that David uh, paints. And it's really the acceptance of this work that enables him to start to have pupils. And one of his first pupils is Vicar. So you can imagine why I was so excited to get a painting by Vicar because you cannot get a painting by David. You could not today, you couldn't maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. Well, what led to neoclassicism? A lot of things, the Age of Enlightenment in general, people going uh, to um, uh, Italy, to uh, the ancient Middle East, um, and here you see a view of the first discovery of the temple, when the temples at Pompeii. Uh, this is when Herculaneum and Pompeii were discovered and they were finding out this incredible ancient world. It had been discovered, rediscovered, let me say, during the Renaissance in the 14th, 15th century, but now there's so many great documents in terms of buildings, architecture, etc., that they can um, relate to. And so, you probably know, many people went on the grand tour to Italy in the 18th century, particularly the English, who were sort of ruling the world at that point. Certainly not today, sadly. Um, but in uh, any case, uh, here you see gentlemen who are, um, this is before uh, cell phones and smartphones and Snapchat and all, and they want to have images of them in Rome. So they commission people like Patoni and others to make these life-size portraits to hang in their great mansions back home. And you can see they're usually hanging around some Roman ruin, a triumphal arch, or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> it's the beginnings of the neoclassical uh, tradition. We have a wonderful um, portrait at um, the Worcester Art Museum, and this is by Patoni. Uh, in fact, um, I bought this the year after I arrived at Worcester, uh, 1975. Um, you know, when I tell things like that to my students at Holy Cross or WPI, they're ready to put me in the Roman gallery. <laughs> but for you, I'm sure it's just like yesterday, right? 1975? Well, we bought this painting, I remember, for $6,000. <laughs> At auction, we actually didn't see it, but we had a representative in uh, London who had cataloged works for us, and he said, you should go for this. And right after that, this artist just shot to the top in terms of popularity mm -hmm. in the uh, 1980s and 90s, and his painting became very uh, expensive. But it's uh, John Corbett of Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury, as we say here, England, uh, and he's on the Grand Tour, uh, and he's holding, actually, could be a print or a drawing, and it's the, um, the um, a Roman temple uh, there, uh, and um, it's the Pantheon. And what's so wonderful about this particular image of it, it has two, oops, two bell towers on it that were added in the 17th century during the Baroque period, which has since been taken down. For a long time we thought that Bernini added them, and then they got to be known as the ass's ears on the Pantheon. Uh, but now there was just much more respect for the ancient world. You know, during the Renaissance, so many um, buildings that were built by the Catholic Church were made out of stones that were taken down uh, from the Roman um, temples and all. In fact, the expression was, what the barbarians didn't do, the Barberini did. The Barberini being the papal family. Um, but that was to change in the 18th century when people saw um, and had much more respect during this neoclassical um, period. Uh, in fact, just something interesting that I learned only recently, by um, a scholar here in Worcester. Um, uh, she's American, and her husband is um, our um, registrar at the Worcester Art Museum, and she uh, actually teaches a course in England online on gardens. And um, she researched this gentleman's estate and found out that 
this is amazing. <laughs> he had the best legs of any man in England in the 18th century. <laughs> and they were so proud of it. And he wrote about that. And, and there are pictures of him with his men there, his, his friends in England, showing off their legs. <laughs> we boys don't change. <laughs> anyway, I thought you'd like to know that because um, the best scams in England in the 18th century. Uh, it is sad that we didn't get a full length portrait. For Six thousand dollars we've got this one. Anyway. Uh, another painting by David before we get on to Vicar. Um, this one, uh, you probably know the subject. Uh, it's the um, Socrates, um, the death of Socrates. I think you all know Socrates who had these uh, students and he was teaching them some wonderful things, but um, people didn't like what he was teaching them. And so um, he um, had to uh, commit suicide basically to take the hemlock. And there you see his students including Plato at the foot of his bed, just can't accept this, understandably. Uh, and he does it very stoically there on his bed, pointing to the greater good. Uh, and then you see all these uh, grown men weeping around him, turning their head, but offering the hemlock because that's what he wanted to do if he's being condemned for what he was um, teaching. In any case, um, these uh, are the images that led to the uh, revolution of overthrowing the Ancien Regime. Uh, I always have to show this work in connection with this. It's a death scene too, but now it's contemporary. This art historian is often referred to as the first modern art in that it's contemporary life. It's the death of Marat, who was this um, uh, 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 politician, I should say writer, journalist, and uh, Charlotte Corday came in and shot him because she didn't agree with what he's doing. And he, he had some illness that he had to sit in a tub most of the day. So he used it to write. You can see his writing desk is right on his tub. So it's very realistic. It's not showing him you know, in a robe or a contemporary dress. It is, but he's in a bathtub. And you can see he's just been killed. So you can see why um, these kinds of pictures became popular. I'm showing you on the left an early work by David. By David. This is the Rococo style. This is how he started out. That was the popular style during the first half of the 18th century. When we know the rich became super, super rich, became rather decadent, probably sort of like what just happened last, well, you know, revealed last week about people paying millions of dollars to get their kids into college. That kind of class. <laughs> Some of them, not all. But, um, they were, and you can see this is a portrait. Um, it's a beautiful painting, don't get me wrong. Um, the rich have the money and they're gonna patronize the artists and uh, the artists do what they want uh, for them. Sometimes they break the rules. But you can see the contrast in this artist's own life between 1775 and 1793. What's in between? The French Revolution. Yeah. So, okay, now let's move on uh, to Vicar. You can see how excited I was when I found this painting uh, with an English dealer. Um, and um, because it's, it relates so much to uh, the Osirati, which is the, the great painting by uh, David in the Louvre. I was really impressed by it, but I was dumbfounded when I found the date of it, when I learned what the date of it was. I thought it had to be around the time of the Osirati. No, no. It's from the early 18th century, as you saw. It's 1826 to 27. We'll see later. It was painted for the French ambassador to Rome, which only tells me that classic arts hung on much longer in Italy. Makes sense. That's where the classical world was, much of it. Uh, whereas David himself had left France, gone on to Belgium, for safety's sake in a way, and he became more of a romantic artist, the next movement. But I. After a while, I really had a hard time accepting that. <laughs> and I thought, well, Jim, it's history, it's what it is, and it certainly shows the influence of, of David. Um, so um, uh, we acquired it. Now, the, one of the reasons we could acquire it, uh, it was painted in Italy, it never went back to France, it never was in France, and so it was available. The French would have undoubtedly claimed this as one of the great works of, da, of Vicar. So, okay, we acquired it. Um, we had very well represented the first half of the 18th century. This painting, interestingly, was acquired right during the beginning of World War II, 1942. Uh, uh, the um, pater, it's the dance, and this is a good example. And it's about the same size of the Vicar, so 
often they'll hang on two sides of the room to show the great division that happened with the revolution, and that's certainly important for us in America because it parallels our own revolution. Um, and uh, I'll just bring up a close-up. You can see these people have a lot of time on their hands, going off to an island, dressed fancily, and uh, just having these fête galants, as we call them, these gallant feasts. Um, this is what we call the Rococo style, Rococo style. And that's completely overthrown when we move on to the neoclassical style. So neoclassicism, I felt Worcester really should have a great neoclassical painting. Why did I feel that way? Well, such a great teaching collection, but there are other reasons. Let's go way back in history. The beginning of the art museum starts with the Salisbury family in a way. Um, Stephen Salisbury III founded the Worcester Art Museum. His father, shown here, Stephen II, went on the grand tour. Uh, he was there when it was the Rococo period, uh, or I should say, no, I should say the Romantic period, but just uh, sort of at the end of the neoclassical period. And um, uh, he might have seen Vicar's work, but he spent two years traveling uh, throughout uh, Europe, including even into Russia. Um, when he came back, uh, he built this great house, which is neoclassical in style, one of the great uh, houses in Worcester. Hopefully, we can better preserve it. It's privately owned now. They do take good care inside, but the outside needs a bit of work. Um, <clears throat> this uh, was moved. Um, it was um, a little bit further forward in front of a great estate overlooking Lincoln Square. And then it was moved back to make way for the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the auditorium. And then um, Harbor Street was connected with Tuckman Street that way. But um, we have nice photographs of inside that building. And not only do you see how the Salisbury's lived, but you can see what they collected. If you look back there, um, you see uh, a sculpture that Stephen II, again, acquired not on his first trip to Europe, but another trip in the 1850s. In fact, um, he's the first one to bring a life-size sculpture of Michelangelo to America, a copy, of course, and that's now in the <coughs> courthouse. But this one is in the Worcester Art Museum. It's not on view right now, um, but this work also is a great example of a neoclassical style that hangs on very long in Rome, as we saw with Vicar. And this was done by um, uh, an American artist, Thomas Crawford. And it now sits in our American galleries on the original stand that was made for it. So again, we have this great neoclassical tradition at the Worcester Museum. The original building, which Stephen Salisbury paid for, the land on which it stands, is a classical revival building. Um, if you went inside it, shortly after it opened, you would see it was filled with plaster casts of uh, copies of these great Greek and Roman sculptures, uh, all of which were unfortunately given away or destroyed, except for a couple. We have one in our library now, um, the, uh, in the 1930s when Worcester had a great collection. This is how American museums began with this classical material. And then what did we start collecting in terms of original art? Right away, there was a great interest in the ancient world here in Worcester. In fact, if you look around Salisbury Street area or else, so many of the buildings are classical revival buildings. But this is uh, one of our first um, ancient sculptures, this Venus. Piece. It's a, a, a Roman copy of a Greek sculpture. Um, we have wonderful Greek pots, as you can see here. We have some fabulous Roman heads, including on the left there, Caligula and Nero. And I think we learned when we were talking about portraiture, they didn't look anything like this. <laughs> They're glorified there. And this is a really interesting collection that we have. I'll show you four little pots, and they're about that big. These are like perfume jars, uh, ointment jars. And they're um, uh, four of uh, a group of about 50, 60 objects that we acquired in 1905 from relatives of this man, Frank Calvert, who was the first man to excavate at Troy. He was an amateur English archaeologist, and his brother made a lot of money in the business world and supported him. And he went uh, to the Troy, as you can see there on the map, and uh, he started digging, acquired many of these works. Uh, this is before Schliemann, who came in almost like a bulldozer. And um, we have his only, the only collection of his work in America. In fact, it was a scholar at Clark University who started seeing his name on some of our objects. 
and wrote the first book on Frank Calvert, so now he's better known. <clears throat> and of course, Worcester did a major excavation in the 1930s with the Louvre and two other American museums. We excavated the ancient city of Antioch. There is a photograph from the first year of the dig, best documented dig up to, the, up to that time. They're actually photographing from the stanchion there. And um, uh, as a result, we now have the largest collection of Roman mosaics in America, including this one that was found when they were doing that photograph. It's part of a dining room floor there that got divided among the five organizations that sponsored the dig. Wellesley College gave in kind. They didn't give money, but they gave a professor. Um, and uh, I show you this work because it's been on view for a while, and it just was on view at Harvard University. It's come back, and hopefully we'll get it back on view now. But we do have not only the largest collection of Roman mosaics in America, we have the largest mosaic that was found at Antioch, larger than the one that you will see at the Louvre. Uh, then, uh, when the ancient world was reappreciated in a major way, was the Renaissance. And we have one of the greatest collections in America of Renaissance art, particularly thanks to our first director and a couple major collectors here in Worcester. Uh, we were able to buy this material when it was still available. Many of these objects coming out of wealthy English families whose estates were too much to support as they moved into the 20th century. And of course, the uh, Andrea del Sarto painting there at the lower right, which I was happy to find in the church here in Worcester, one of only four paintings by Sarto in America, one of the great Renaissance masters. So, um, okay, we have a great classical collection, even in moving into our American collection. This is um, a wonderful portrait donated to the museum by a family who descended from this gentleman. And unlike most uh, Americans, he was a businessman, his business took him to France, not England. And um, in fact, that chair, I guess, still exists in the family. This is a chair he took on the boat with him, <laughs> for like going first class. And those are all the letters. Instead of a computer, that's how he had to work. But that's um, uh, Samson Riley Stoddard Wilder. Uh, so many museums don't have neoclassical portraits like that one. And then our decorative arts, we do have a lot of great um, decorative arts. And I show you just two examples. In fact, on Saturday I gave a lecture at the uh, Payne Estate, the DAR house, the, um, the Oaks up on Lincoln Street, which is so ironic that the Daughters of the American Revolution owned the Payne House because they were the loyalists here in Worcester. But we have the, the finest collection of a part of second second largest collection of Parker Silver in um, America, next to Boston, of course. But we have the, his most important commission, which was this tea service for a loyalist family, commissioned four months before the Boston Tea Party, the Payne family. And there you see it, 1773. So it's a Rococo style. So you're starting to learn the difference between Rococo and Neoclassical. So that's the Payne family. Then, thanks to the Salisbury family, we got the teapot on the bottom there which, as you can see, is two decades later, done during the neoclassical period. And who is this for? This was commissioned by Stephen II and uh, his wife, Stephen and Elizabeth Tuckman Salisbury. So even in our decorative arts, we can show that transition from the Rococo to the classical style, from this um, <clears throat> rounded forms, very decorative, to these very simple classical lines of classicism. And we have such a fabulous French collection. <laughs> <laughs> right from you know, the early days, um, we, um, just as you can see, uh, we, during my lifetime, we acquired the great Rigaud there at the top middle, um, the painter of Louis XIV <coughs> with hands. We have the great Fontainebleau painting off to the left there. And all the way down the line, uh, of course, French Impressionists. We were the first museum in the world to buy Monet, it's water lilies, um, and um, the first in, the, excuse, in, in this country, and the first in the world to buy Gauguin before the French even. So we needed a French neoclassical painting, I decided. So that's how the search really began. And this is the one we ended up with. Now let me tell you about it. Um, There's a great story. Uh, how many remember the story of Electra? <laughs> yeah, we forget some of the stories, but I know you've heard of it. But let me go. It comes from Sophocles. And uh, basically, uh, there is Electra uh, with her um, uh, holding a, a jar, an urn, and uh, falling into the arms of her brother. Okay? 
Well, and there is a friend of um, her brother, Electra, uh, Pilades, who is saying, shh, be quiet. What's the story behind this? Now, remember, no TV back then, um, <laughs> uh, um, no movies. Uh, these are the soaps, if you will, of the day. But they <coughs> teach moral principles. Very important, certainly, during the French Revolution and moving into the, the um, 19th uh, century when democracies were starting to sprout up. Well, here's how the story goes. Uh, the two central figures there are the, the children of Agamemnon. You probably know um, Agamemnon uh, during the, the, the uh, Trojan War. You probably don't remember this part, but he sacrificed the other daughter. Uh, yeah, horrible things happen in these Greek tragedies. But um, he uh, sacrificed his other daughter so that um, the winds would blow right for his ships to sail during the Trojan War. Now, so let me bring up a detail here. So we, over here you can see, again, compositionally how it somewhat relates using a, a classical setting for this stage-like scene. Okay, oh, let me, I guess I have a few pictures. Here's a, another self-portrait of Bicar. And I do want to tell you where he was born in Lille, very far north in France. In fact, as a young man, this is not the, the nicest side about Vicar, he helped to bring paintings from the Low Countries to France. This is when the French were looting a lot of those other countries. That's why the Louvre has so many great Rubenses and Van Dykes, etc. That's what they were doing back then. He um, studies, uh, he's a, he comes from humble background, he's the son of a carpenter. Uh, he went to the free school in Lille. And then he goes to Paris, and that's where he um, studies with Jacques-Louis David, one of his first pupils. Okay? And he goes to Rome, uh, to Italy, uh, with David, and there he starts drawing like crazy all the works of art that he sees in the Uffizi, in the Pitti Palace, and all around Rome. And these are some of the works that got published from the drawings that he did, whether he was drawing medals or paintings or sculptures, he learned all about these ancient subjects. In fact, here you can see uh, one of those prints from his drawings, and this arrest is killing Clytemnestra. Why did he do that? That's his wife. Well, when he came back from the war, he found that she was cheating on him, right? Yeah. Uh, and she had um, partnered up with uh, Aegisthus, um, the, uh, <clears throat> um, this other man, and he wasn't happy about that. Um, uh, but what happens is she kills him. Now this is, we'll continue, <laughs> this is the kind of neoclassical painting that Vicar starts doing. It looks like a David, doesn't it? Uh, this is, you can see there, um, the Virgil reading the Aeneid. Uh, a very classical setting, these bright, bold colors, beautifully drawn, and mm -hmm. refold of the drapery, makes sense. I'll show you how they created these paintings. It's like creating a movie. Um, they start with nude figures and build them up, clothe them, and then they, after many, many drawings, they paint them. Um, here's a later self-portrait of Vicar, um, and you can see that he was well connected by the time he was in, in Italy. Here he's painting Julia Bonaparte and her daughters, and there's a, a drawing he did of the same woman. So um, he came a long ways from being the son of a carpenter in Lille. The side that I don't like about him uh, is that he took a lot of art out of Italy. Uh, these are the caravans. He wasn't doing this alone. He was part of the commission under Napoleon um, to bring so much art out of Italy, which is now in the Louvre. Uh, they obviously take good care of it, but it's amazing how much was taken. Um, so our painting, as I said, it was done for the French ambassador uh, to um, uh, Italy. And that ambassador, you see him there, almost an unpronounceable name, um, is on the right there. And um, he uh, um, was ambassador to Spain first from uh, 1814 to 23, and then he went and became the ambassador for France to Italy. And he was there from 1823 to 28. So he, he's the one who commissioned Vicar to do this, and then he moves on. Uh, so I assume that it probably stayed in the family still trying to track down his provenance. Um, but here we have the big picture. So um, you can see the, the um, kids in the foreground. I'm going to bring up a detail here, or bring it up closer. So you can see to the left in the background, that's the tomb of Agamemnon. 
He's dead now because his wife uh, arranged for him to be killed. And um, <clears throat> off, um, maybe I'll just walk over there. Um, there's two sides of the tomb you can see. Here is actually Agamemnon crossing the river Styx into the underworld, into the heavens or wherever he's going to go. And then this is an important scene because there is where he's sacrificing his other daughter to Diana so that the winds would blow right because she controlled those, <laughs> uh, the goddess. Uh, and so when that happened, guess what? <laughs> the son leaves town. I'm getting out of Dodge. I'm in my car. My mother arranged to kill my father. My father killed my sister. Whoa. These are the tragedies that they wallowed over. <laughs> what, can, what lessons can we learn about these? So he goes up to the north to consult the oracle, um, uh, um, Orestes. And the oracle says, you have to go back. And you have to kill your mother. You have to make things straight. <laughs> Challenging, isn't it? Um, you have to set things straight. And see, parallel, people are making parallels between this and government and society in general. How to set things straight. Well, the sister stayed, Electra stayed there. She pined for her father. She pined for her sister and hung around the tomb. So, okay, now, the son comes back. How's he going to get into this palace, right? How's he going to get in? Because uh, he's person non gratis. Uh, uh, and um, so what he does, he takes a jar of ashes and he pretends that he's not himself, that he's bringing back the ashes of himself, that he's now dead. Okay? So they get into the palace and there he meets his sister. And now, now she's lost her brother. She's about ready to die herself. But this is the magic moment. She's falling into the arms of her brother. Okay? There's always a happy ending. <laughs> but what's um, the, 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 the friend there, off to the right, saying, Shh, don't get so excited. I know you found it's your brother, but we've got work to do. We've got to go kill your mother. Oh, God. I'm sorry I'm doing this to you. But it's keeping you awake, I see. Um, anyway, so there's the mother in the back, and that's uh, and Jesus, her boyfriend. So we won't go into the details, but they take care of that. And then they uh, live happily ever after, I guess you would say. <laughs> so it's again what the oracle said they should do. Um, okay. Now I really love this story all the more. I love this painting all the more because I began to see that obviously it's a story that's teaching moral principles, setting things straight, even though a horrible way to do it. Um, I wanted to show you. Um, a bit how this work was constructed. First of all, lots of drawings go into a painting like this. Uh, here you can see, um, this, I'm going to show you a group of sketches here, by Vicar. Uh, this is Electra, who's pining for her brother. Here you see another drawing where she's got the ashes. She thinks he's dead. Uh, these are all sketches. There are some people I think that's probably her brother saying, no, don't worry, those aren't my ashes, <laughs> I'm right behind you. So he's trying to pick the perfect moment to depict to tell the story. So he does lots of sketches. You can see another sketch. Well, I, I'm going to take a, a moment to show you, um, this is a man well connected by now, he did a portrait of the Pope. Um, um, <clears throat> this was done before he did the painting for the ambassador. But you can see even the Pope, he begins with a nude figure. You see, seated in the chair, and then he closes it, and then he uses that for the painting. And even before, between the second drawing and the final painting, there's lots of changes. So there are probably a lot of sketches <coughs> that may not have. But this is how they, uh, they created these incredibly important classical paintings, which most of you have to go to the Louvre to see. <clears throat> well, there are sketches that remain for our painting. <clears throat> and you can see them. I'm going to go through them in a little more detail. But you can see the one at the top, I'm very happy to say, that we now own. Uh, David Afton, our curator, former curator of Princeton Drawings, who spent 25 years at the Worcester Museum, thought, well, if we have the painting, let's see if we can get it one of the drawings. <clears throat> and so he bought that, I'll bring it up to you. And you can see it's an early sketch where uh, Orestes is now a nude figure. You start with the anatomy, obviously you have to know how to drape these figures, but <clears throat> you start with the muscles and all of that. And you can see it definitely relates to the painting. And I'm going to show you the next step would be this drawing, and then you would have the painting. 
but maybe several sketches in between. Okay? Well, this pair of paintings, I'm not sure where they are today, but when I bought the painting, they were owned by the director of the Louvre, <laughs> Isir Rosenberg. So I don't know if they descend in the family, I'll have to do some more research. <clears throat> but I was so happy to find images of these paintings or drawings. Why? Because our painting, when I finally decided we should go for it, I wanted to make sure it was not a copy. Our painting is not signed. That didn't scare me because many paintings are not signed. If they're signed, often the signature gets taken off in pr proper cleaning or someone might um, just take it off to claim it their own. But it was the drawing on the left of Electra that convinced me, and there's no question now, that we are not looking at a copy, we're looking at the original work. Uh, <clears throat> you see the drawing next to the, the Electra from our painting. Do you notice anything different between the drawing, which is pretty close to the end of his preparations, and the painting? Who's going to get an A? Oh, after observation skills, yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to really see who's out there. Anyone see any difference? Very dress, or the, the lowest, the low part of her drapery, whatever she's wearing. Her, very good. Her drapery is not the same. You see how it scoops down here, and you see how it scoops yeah. down over there. Okay? Well, we rushed our painting to the lab. Um, we brought it over for, you know, a to see if we're going to buy it, and we did an x-ray, and there you see the x-ray. And it's very hard to read an x-ray, but you will see both forms of the drapery. The final form is coming through, too, because the lead white is showing. But if a careful study of that, you can see the earlier design that's um, in the drawing. So that convinced me we're not looking at a copy, because a, a copy, is, copy is the final design, right? We love to find called pentamenti, where the under design comes through, or through x-ray find other changes. Yeah. Okay, so now we buy the painting, um, and um, we're happy about that. Um, I wanted to learn more about Bikar, of course. Um, fun to research him. Learned that not only was a great artist of that period, had a great mentor, David, but he was a great collector. <clears throat> He collected drawings by all the great masters from the Renaissance, uh, <clears throat> including Raphael and Michelangelo, etc. Uh, even the northern artists like Durer, and they were stolen. And then he rebuilt this collection. Uh, there was a, the David, the, or excuse me, the Raphael on the left, one of them. Here are some more. These are from the Renaissance, an incredible collection. Uh, and he gave the whole collection to his hometown museum in Lille. Uh, it was a small museum that joined with another museum and became a great museum. And that's where you really have to go to see a lot of his work. There are a couple other paintings by him in America now, one in New Orleans and one in the Arlington of Chicago, a major work. But so many of his drawings are there. Um, so we are certainly happy to have this painting at the Westrar Museum. Um, I want to show you something um, that really convinced me what a great work this is. When I was looking at it, in the dealer shop in London. Um, as many of you know, I started out in my career as a, a painter. And um, I guess as a painter, you have a little more appreciation for how these things are built up. But also the ability to control what we call the valeur, the value, the light and dark. And not just the color, but um, the, so that these various figures stand in space, etc. Remember, this is like theater. It does look like a stage set. But I'm going to show you what the dealer happily was able to do for me. He had one of those rear stop lights that you can dim in the gallery. So I'm going to dim it for you and show you what happened. As you start to dim, first the, the tomb starts to go away. And then, a little bit more, mm -hmm. the mother disappears and her lover. And then the friend. Mm -hmm. And now you have just the brother together and then her alone. So it's an amazing control of light and darkness of it. It's like theater. In fact, when we had a, a movie made at the Worcester Art Museum. A couple have been made there now, but, uh, the, the one called Maiden Heist. And I guess that's when I first realized that I always thought film was more of an extension of theater. 
But I don't think it is. I think it's more of an extension of painting like this, neoclassical painting, or just in general, traditional painting. Um, because I worked with some of those great actors, yeah, <laughs> I had one little part in that film, but I saw they could, uh, they're incredible. I mean, they take on a part, and what amazed me was that they can keep character, even though the last scene might be shot first and the first scene shot last, they can keep that over the various months. You do maybe three minutes of filming in a day, and, and uh, they keep that character. But if they don't get it right, you know, they can do it over and over again. To a point, I've heard actors tell me this, in fact, a couple of them that were Worcester, that at a certain point we say, I've done my best, I can't do any more. And that told me something, that um, really who's so creative on those films is really the director and the filmmaker. Because when you get to the studio to put the film together, you have to work with what you've got. I'm not diminishing the talent of these artists. But it's sort of like creating a still life. You put the apple on the table and then you paint it, and how you paint it makes all the difference. How you light it, how you film it from the different various views, etc. And you saw how David and Vicar worked. Nude figures, like little dolls, building them up, ranging them to tell the story very clearly. And that's such a part of um, neoclassical art. Um, there you have it um, with um, David. I can also tell you that we probably will never get a painting by David, but um, we do have a great painting to show the first part of the 18th century and then neoclassicism with this. But we did get a drawing by David. Uh, David Acton found this on the market, and so we do have a drawing by the teacher of Jean Baptiste Joseph Vicar, whom I hope you will go see at the Worcester Art Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. You said you bought this picture. Why? What made this picture valuable? Well, for a lot of reasons. Um, because, um, uh, first of all, there are not many paintings by that artist from the 18th century. Most of them are in the major museums. Um, there are all kinds of laws now, and they're good. Don't get me wrong, they're good and Worcester has always respected those, for taking works out of different countries. The UNESCO laws, and um, some go back further than, most of them are 1970-71, and some go back earlier. I remember when I first came to the Worcester Art Museum, for example, buying, acquiring pre-Columbian art. We had a great collection already by mid-century, and we were offered a lot by Worcesterites, many who went to Mexico and Central and South America, um, and bought these things back, but we never accepted anything that we couldn't um, uh, that was taken out of uh, those countries after 1970. I remember the museum was very hard-nosed about that. Now museums are really, you know, attentive to that. So there's that factor. Um, and um, it's a great master. Uh, he wasn't so appreciated in the 19th century because styles move on, Romanticism, Impressionism. And it's just like that painting we bought for $6,000 by the 1980s uh, would have been a lot more. Certain periods were not appreciated in the 20th century, in the 19th century, like Baroque in general. Yeah. Yeah. And then they become cheap again. <laughs> Look at El Greco, for example. They thought he was crazy, all his distorted forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we bought our El Greco for about $7,000 in 1921. Yeah. Any other question? So it's a rarity. I mean, it's a, but I will be the first to say that. It really upsets me, the price that's being paid for paintings today, or any of these works of art. Um, it may sound crazy to you to hear this from me, from me, but when you're paying four or five hundred million dollars for a painting, I just think that's out of whack. And that's the price of a town. <laughs> and the painting is valuable. Um, what's the problem here is that many people who are buying these paintings, I think are buying them transferring money. I think, some of them. Um, and uh, do they love the work of art? I, I hope they do, but maybe they're the only ones that are going to be able to see it, too, because to borrow a work of, like, of art like that, you take um, a Gauguin that might be three or four hundred million dollars, how do you do a show of Gauguin anymore? You know, to ensure it, those paintings for one day. Or, um, yeah, you might, the only way you can really do a huge paint show like that is get an indemnity from the government that the government would stand behind you. But, Museums just can't afford that. Yeah. So it's weird, isn't it?
Yeah. Anything else? Any other question? Yeah. No? Okay. Okay, I'll let you go back down the hill. I saw you were trying to. Down the hill is easier. <laughs> okay.